It is 1632, the heart of winter in Central Europe, and a Swedish army of 12,000 men has just marched 400 miles from the Baltic coast into the frozen forests of Germany. They have no supply lines, no food depots, no warm barracks waiting for them. Tonight, the temperature will drop to minus 20 degrees. Most armies in this situation would be dead by morning. The soldiers would burn through their meagre firewood in two hours, huddled together in the dark, and one by one they would freeze. But these Swedish soldiers had a secret. A single technique that let one man with one log create enough heat and light to survive the entire night. While enemy armies burned five times as much wood and still froze, Swedish soldiers stayed warm with a method so efficient that it would survive 400 years. And here is the strangest part. Modern campers, with all their expensive gear and carefully dried wood, still cannot match what a 17th century soldier could do with a single freshly cut tree and an axe. Today, I'm going to show you exactly how they did it. The Thirty Years' War. To understand why this invention mattered, you need to understand the war that created it. The Thirty Years' War, fought from 1618 to 1648, was the deadliest conflict in European history before World War I. It killed approximately one-third of the entire population of the German states. Not one-third of soldiers, one-third of everyone. What made this war uniquely brutal was the complete absence of logistics. There was no supply chain, no military bases with hot meals and warm beds. Armies in this era survived by what historians call living off the land, which is a polite way of saying they took everything from the people they encountered. A typical army needed a population density of at least 35 people per square kilometre just to feed itself. When armies passed through the same region twice, there was often nothing left, no food, no firewood, no people. Now imagine you are a Swedish soldier in this nightmare. You have marched for weeks through territory that has already been stripped bare by three different armies before you. The villages are empty, the forests have been cut down for previous campfires, and winter is coming. The Swedish army found an answer, and it started with rethinking everything about how fire works. The problem with traditional campfires, let me explain why traditional campfires are actually terrible for survival. I know that sounds strange. Humans have been making campfires for hundreds of thousands of years. But there is a crucial difference between a campfire that works when conditions are perfect and a fire system that works when your life depends on it. Traditional campfires have five critical weaknesses that most people never consider. They require dry ground because wet soil or snow constantly evaporates moisture into your fire, cooling it down and often putting it out entirely. They consume enormous amounts of wood, burning through about one cubic foot every single hour, which for an army of thousands means stripping entire forests bare. They also take forever to become useful for cooking, since you cannot cook over open flames and must wait at least an hour for embers to form. They require constant attention because 10 minutes of neglect can mean a dying fire. And perhaps most dangerously, they spread, embers fly, flames jump, and in a forest, a campfire is always one gust of wind away from disaster. So the Swedish soldiers asked themselves a simple question. What if we could build a fire that solved all of these problems at once, one that could burn for hours unattended and be ready for cooking in minutes instead of an hour? The answer they found was so simple and so brilliant that 400 years later survival experts still consider it one of the greatest fire innovations in human history. The Swedish torch revealed. They called it the Swedish torch and the basic concept is almost stupidly simple. Take a single log, stand it upright, cut deep vertical slits from the top, stopping a few inches from the bottom and light it from the top. That is the entire technique. But within this simplicity is hidden one of the most elegant pieces of fire engineering ever devised. Here is what happens when you light a Swedish torch. The fire starts at the top of the log, in the centre where the cuts meet. As the flames grow, they heat the air directly above them. And since hot air is less dense than cold air, it rises. This is basic physics, but here is where the genius comes in. As that hot air rises out of the top of the log, it creates a zone of low pressure at the bottom of those cuts. Cold, oxygen-rich air gets sucked in to fill that vacuum, feeds the fire, gets heated, rises, and pulls in more fresh air. The log becomes its own perfectly engineered combustion chamber, a self-sustaining cycle that requires no intervention. 
The temperatures this creates are extraordinary. The glowing centre of a Swedish torch reaches between 1000 and 1200 degrees Celsius, which is 1800 to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. To put that in perspective, that is hotter than the flame of a standard propane torch. From a single log with no fuel and no accelerants, just wood and physics. Why it beats modern methods. Now let me show you exactly how much better this is than modern campfire methods. And I want to be specific here because this is not nostalgia or romanticizing the past. This is measurable, documented superiority. Consider fuel efficiency first. A traditional campfire burns approximately one cubic foot of wood per hour. So for a five hour fire, you need five cubic feet of wood. A Swedish torch of the same size burns for two to five hours on a single log, representing a fuel savings of roughly 80%. Then there is cooking time. With a traditional campfire, you need to wait 60 to 90 minutes for usable embers. A Swedish torch is ready for cooking in 15 to 20 minutes because the flame is concentrated and directional rather than wild and spreading. The flat top of a standing log becomes a perfect cooking surface where you can place a cast iron skillet directly, no grill or tripod needed. Ground conditions matter too. A traditional campfire needs dry ground because wet soil or snow constantly saps heat through conduction and evaporation. A Swedish torch stands above the ground with the fire burning inside the log, protected from moisture below. Swedish soldiers made fires in the middle of snowstorms, on frozen ground, on muddy battlefields. Modern campers cancel their trips if it rained the day before. But the advantages go beyond just efficiency. Swedish soldiers quickly discovered that this single invention could solve multiple problems at once. The tall vertical flame made an excellent signal fire, visible from great distances in the flat European terrain. In the morning, they could place a container of snow on the flat top and have drinking water within minutes, something that would take far longer with a scattered campfire. And because the fire was contained and elevated, they could distribute several smaller torches around a camp rather than gathering everyone around a single large fire, giving commanders better control over their men and reducing the catastrophic risk of one fire being extinguished and leaving an entire unit in the cold. Think about that for a moment. 400 years ago, soldiers with axes and basic tools could make fire in conditions that defeat modern campers with waterproof matches and petroleum-based fire starters. We did not progress. We forgot the science deeper dive. For those of you who want to understand the engineering at a deeper level, let me explain exactly why this design works so well. The principle is called the stack effect, or sometimes the chimney effect. In physics terms, it is the movement of air into and out of structures due to buoyancy, which occurs because of temperature differences between inside and outside air. The formula is simple. Greater temperature difference plus greater height equals stronger effect. Inside a Swedish torch, the temperature difference between the burning centre at over 1000 degrees and the outside air is enormous. The height of the log, typically 50 to 150 centimetres, provides enough vertical distance for a powerful draft to develop. The result is a self-sustaining combustion cycle where fire heats air, hot air rises, rising air creates low pressure, low pressure pulls in fresh oxygen and fresh oxygen feeds the fire. This is the same principle that makes industrial blast furnaces work. The same principle that ventilated mines before electric fans existed. The same principle that architects use today in designing naturally ventilated buildings. Swedish soldiers figured it out 400 years ago, probably without understanding the physics at all. They just knew it worked. There is another historical fire technique that survivalists often compare to the Swedish torch, the Dakota fire hole. Both use the same basic physics of controlled airflow to create efficient combustion. But there is a crucial difference. The Dakota fire hole requires you to dig two connected holes in the ground, which means you need dry, diggable soil. In frozen ground, rocky terrain or swampy conditions, it simply does not work. The Swedish torch requires nothing but a single log and something to cut it with. It works on snow, on rock, on mud, anywhere you can stand a log upright. This portability and adaptability is why the Swedish torch spread across cultures while the Dakota firehole remained a regional technique. There is a reason the Swedish army under King Gustavus Adolphus was considered the most effective fighting force in Europe. They did not just innovate in weapons and tactics. They innovated in survival because an army that cannot keep its soldiers alive between battles has already lost. Regional variation. 
The Swedish torch did not stay Swedish for long. As the technique spread across Europe and eventually the world, different cultures adapted it to their local conditions and materials. And these variations tell us something important about how good ideas evolve. In Finland, they call it the lumberjack's candle. Finnish loggers working in the far north, in temperatures that would kill an unprepared person in hours, used this technique daily. What is interesting about the Finnish version is that in the dry Arctic environment, dead standing wood contains very little moisture. Finnish loggers would simply ski up to a dead tree, cut it to length, split it, and have a working fire in minutes. The climate did the seasoning work for them. The Finnish Forest Museum Lusto actually claims that Finns invented this technique first, before the Swedes adopted it. Who was first? We may never know, but both cultures recognised genius when they saw it. In Russia and Siberia, they call it the Russian tree torch, or the Siberian tree torch. The Russian adaptation added something clever. Birch bark. Because birch bark is waterproof and extremely flammable, Russian versions often wrap it around the outside or stuff it into the cuts as a fire starter, making ignition almost foolproof even in the damp conditions of the Siberian taiga. In North America today, you will hear it called the Canadian candle. American and Canadian bushcraft enthusiasts have adopted the technique wholesale. Though interestingly, the North American version is usually smaller, 30 to 50 centimetres tall, instead of up to 150. The reason is portability. Modern outdoorsmen want something they can carry in a backpack, while the Swedish soldiers who invented this technique made them fresh from whatever trees they could find. Different needs, different adaptations. Here is an irony worth noting. Since the 2010s, commercial versions of the Swedish torch have become widely available in Europe and the United States. You can now buy pre-cut, kiln-dried logs made from alder or beech, packaged in plastic and sold at hardware stores and camping suppliers. A technique invented by desperate soldiers who had to improvise with whatever green wood they could find has become a convenience product. The same civilization that forgot how to make fire efficiently has now figured out how to sell the solution back to us in shrink-wrapped packaging. How to make one? Let me show you exactly how to make a Swedish torch. There are actually several methods depending on what tools you have available. The modern chainsaw method is the easiest if you have the equipment. Select a log ideally 30 to 60 centimeters in diameter and 50 to 150 centimeters tall with both ends cut flat so it can stand upright. Using a chainsaw make two perpendicular cuts from the top forming an X pattern or three cuts forming a six pointed star for larger logs. The critical point is to stop your cuts about 6 to 8 centimetres from the bottom because if you cut all the way through the log will fall apart. Add your tinder to the top centre, whether that is dry bark, wood shavings or paper, light it and let physics do the rest. The primitive method is what the original Swedish soldiers would have done and it requires no power tools. Split your log into four quarters using an axe and a betoning technique. Remove some material from the inside of each quarter to create a central chimney then tie the quarters back together with cord, rope or wire while leaving small gaps for airflow. Light from the top. This method takes more time and skill, but it proves something important. You do not need modern tools to make this work. You do not need anything a 17th century soldier would not have had. The bundle method works when you have no single log big enough. Gather three or four straight logs of similar length, about arm thickness, and tie them together in a bundle, standing upright. The gaps between the logs function exactly like the cuts in a single log, allowing air to flow in while fire burns down and the chimney effect takes over. This is the method you use when you are truly desperate, when you have nothing but small wood and cordage, and it still works. Choosing the right wood. Not all wood is equal for this technique, and understanding which wood to use for which purpose will make the difference between a good fire and a great one. For heat and light, you want soft woods like pine, spruce, fir and cedar. These resinous woods catch fire easily and burn brightly because the natural oils and sap act almost like built-in fire starters. The downside is that they burn faster and produce more smoke. For cooking, you want hardwoods like oak, beech, maple, ash, apple and cherry. Hardwoods burn slower and steadier, producing less smoke and less soot, which matters when you are cooking food directly over the flames. Cherry and apple wood actually add a pleasant flavour to meat. Medieval soldiers probably did not care about gourmet flavours, but modern bushcraft cooks certainly do. Here is something that might surprise you. The Swedish torch works with green wood, freshly cut and unseasoned wood, 
that would be nearly impossible to burn in a traditional campfire. The reason is that the temperatures in the centre of a Swedish torch are so extreme, over 1000 degrees Celsius, that they can drive the moisture out of green wood fast enough to keep the fire going. This was crucial for the original Swedish soldiers, who could not carry seasoned firewood across hundreds of miles of enemy territory. They had to use whatever trees they could cut down that day, and the Swedish torch made that possible. Why we forgot? So here is the question I always ask when I discover something like this. If the Swedish torch is so superior, why is it not the standard method everyone uses? Why did we forget? The answer, I think, is industrialization. When you can buy a portable gas stove for $20, why learn to split logs? When fire starters come in waterproof packaging, why understand combustion physics? When you can drive to a campsite with a car full of perfectly dried pre-cut firewood, why develop the skills to make fire from a single green log? We traded knowledge for convenience, and for 99% of modern life, that trade works fine. But that remaining 1%, when the power goes out, when the car breaks down, when you are genuinely lost and genuinely cold and genuinely fighting for survival, that is when the old knowledge becomes priceless. And yet, not everyone forgot. In Scandinavia and parts of Northern Europe, forestry workers still use the Swedish torch daily. Loggers working in remote areas, far from any road or shelter, make them during midday breaks to warm their hands and heat their food. For these workers, the technique never became obsolete because their working conditions never changed they still face the same problems the Swedish soldiers faced 400 years ago. Cold, isolation, and the need for efficient fire with minimal resources. The knowledge survived where it was still needed. Remember those Swedish soldiers at the beginning of this video. 12,000 men, 400 miles from home, in the middle of the deadliest war Europe had ever seen. They survived because they knew something we have forgotten. That fire is not just about having matches. Fire is about understanding how combustion works, how heat moves, how to turn a single piece of wood into hours of warmth. The Swedish torch is 400 years old. It was invented by soldiers who had no formal education in physics or engineering, who figured it out through necessity and trial and error and the absolute need to survive. And yet this technique outperforms most modern methods of fire making in almost every measurable way. Less fuel, faster cooking, works in conditions that defeat modern equipment, self-sustaining and self-ventilating. One log, two to five hours of heat, up to 1200 degrees Celsius in the center. The next time you struggle to keep a campfire going, remember this. Swedish soldiers in 1632 did not have waterproof matches or petroleum fire starters or YouTube tutorials. They had axes, trees, and the knowledge of how to use them. Maybe that is all any of us really need. If you learned something from this video, consider subscribing. I explore forgotten techniques like this every week, showing how medieval people solve problems that we still struggle with today. And if you want to see more content about fire-making techniques from history, let me know in the comments. Until next time.